textbooks, dermatology, primary care. Throughout our lives, we will all interact with the healthcare system. So, what happens when that system is not designed with certain groups of people in mind? As a black person in America, I have experienced firsthand racial disparities in healthcare. The turning point for me came during the pandemic when at a local clinic, I was asked if I had a red rash on my skin. At that point, it dawned on me that some healthcare professionals did not realize that skin rashes do not exhibit the same way on different skin pigmentations. If something so obvious could be so casually overlooked by a healthcare professional, what other elements of care, treatment, research, and education are also being ignored, and what does it mean for people of color using this healthcare system? I am Vivian Kopsinger Birchall, and in this series, we will take a closer look at disparities in healthcare, speaking with medical professionals, and hearing personal stories to get a better understanding of those disparities and explore ideas and strategies for how to bridge the gaps. Well, it's always such a joy to be in the glo at the Global Health Catalyst Summit, especially having conversations with Dr. Wilfred Ngua, who is the director of this summit. Dr. Will, welcome to my show. Thank you, thank you, Vivian. <laughs> uh, and uh, today, the summit is celebrating the launch of the Oncology Commission in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, right <laughs> there. So, um, first of all, what is the theme for this particular summit? Yeah, the theme for this particular summit is uh, the Cancer Moonshot and uh, advancing collaborations to, for global health and development. Part of that is because, you know, we see a great opportunity. Uh, as you heard earlier on, we had um, the Cancer Moonshot, the White House and the U.S. government is really investing a lot into the Cancer Moonshot now. So I think that it's a really great opportunity for us to engage internationally. Let's think about global health as local health. Um, because in that case, you can actually get more people, you know, to get involved and push that forward. And so that, that was a theme for this year. And what is the Cancer Moon Show? Yeah, the Cancer Moon Show is this, uh, it was kind of launched with um, when President Obama was still, you know, the president. So he actually asked President Biden, Vice President Biden then, uh, to, to, to uh, invest into the cancer, uh, to accelerate, you know, cancer um, so it can decrease survival over time. And so actually Congress passed a law uh, around the cancer monitor, uh, a few billion dollars, can't remember how much the amount was, uh, to, to, uh, to make research and catalyze collaborations between the healthcare industry, academic institutions, um, policy makers, so across different sectors, you know, to accelerate, uh, you know, uh, progress towards cancer. And so, you know, so when President Biden became president, he uh, decided just this February, this earlier this year, he reignited it. So he reignited the cancer moonshot, and he set out some new goals. And one of the key goals is that they want to decrease cancer uh, deaths uh, by, in by in 25 years by half in the United States. Then we launched this commission report, and we think that should be a goal that should also be true for Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, actually, it's easier to achieve that in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know why? Because some of the conversation we're having today was, there are some things already that we can just implement. You know, we already know. If you look at the cancer cases for kids, why is it that five kids here in the United States get, you know, they have cancer, four get cured. Whereas in Africa, four die out of five. So there are already some interventions here that you can just, it just needs to apply or adopt it in Africa. So then, the United States is more into, now pushing towards innovation, so doing some research that can come up with new cures and new approaches that can help you know, uh, accelerate that and half the cases in 25 years. Uh, Africa can actually accelerate because we can do both the innovation, but we can also take the things that are already working and take them to Africa you know, and apply them, and that should be able to accelerate even faster. And so uh, when you talk about the moonshot, 
and we also have the Global Health Catalyst. How are the two working hand in hand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the Global Health Catalyst is really to catalyze collaboration. So uh, we want to catalyze the collaboration between the Cancer Moonshot, the US government, and the African Union, Africa, let me say that way. Mm -hmm. uh, such a way that you know they can align their goals. So that's the role of the Global Health Catalyst, which has kind of grown from these different institutions that have partners in different places. But the idea is to really catalyze collaborations, like bring these people together, talk, let's talk and see how ways we can work together, um, see what things are working and what things are not working, and learn lessons from that. And so earlier this morning, that's why we had, um, you know, the Dr. Satish Gopal from the NCS Center for Global Health, who is really, a, you know, kind of like the leader focus on cancer for the U.S. government. Yes, I right. chatted with him. Oh, you chatted with him. Yes. Excellent. And then you also have the, you know, Dr. Carolina Young, who is Carolina Young, who is actually from originally from South Africa and is in the White House now helping with you know, the cancer moonshot. So having engaging them was really important, and that's the role of the Global Health Catalyst Summit. You know, bring these people together, talk, let's see what we can do. And so coming out of this, we hope that the follow-up action, you know, would really be to get these two people to engage these two to kind of see how they can invest into collaborating that can win, both, win-win. So it means that the U.S. wins and Africa wins. Uh, we actually go further. I'm seeing you already as a, a, a middleman or a connector of, uh, in the U.S.-Africa health policy. Hmm. <laughs> because this is, I mean, the moonshot is really uh, the U.S. government and, uh, you know, healthcare in Africa is struggling and there is this middle person, which is a global health colleague yeah, saying we're stepping... The catalyst. The catalyst is never, it's, it's just a catalyst. It's not as important as the, in chemistry, you know, we have, that's where the word actually comes. You have two products, they interact and come up with some outcome, which is really good. But the catalyst does not, it's not important. It's only there. It to is important. It. Yeah, it's important, yeah. But it's, it's not as important as the two, right? So it's only there to help make them work together. Absolutely. And so when it, all right, let's take us back to the oncology report, mm -hmm. uh, the commission report. What are some of the, the some of the findings that you found that really uh, popped up for you? Yeah. Shocking one is that cancer deaths could reach 2030, by 2030, 1 million a year in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, not all of Africa. You know, that will be bigger than other, the other diseases that we're seeing. Right. So that, you know, we knew there was a case like that, that was happening, but we didn't know that the magnitude of it, mm -hmm. uh, which got worse because of COVID. That's why we're projecting that um, even more, more acutely. Um, you know, so that was shocking. And then the, the, chat, the kids always break somebody's heart. So looking at, you know, the report, looking at analysis and showing that, you know, cancer cases, deaths for kids are increasing. Um, you know, it's really a cancer emergency in that case because kids are the future of Africa. Uh, if you don't really address this, and some of these are really preventable. So, you know, these are things, the things we can do, you know, that can really help, you know, precipitate a drop in that. And so the question is, you know, why are we not doing those things? So the commission was able to find out that, you know, this, the, the situation with kids is even worse than, than we see. Right? Why is that? Partly because of the COVID, part of it because um, the, the, re the science around it, because that's why the commission was created to really analyze, look at, you know, what's the situation in Africa in terms of cancer. So by digging deeper, we actually see that the, the systemic barriers to access to treatment are even more acute, you know. So think about, you know, we talked about that uh, earlier on, like things like, you know, um, people having access to, to, to treatment when they already have the cancer, they are always coming late, you know, partly because, you know, the systemic barriers, the cultural barriers, you know, some of them are just that people want to go see their doc, uh, traditional doctor first, you know, and then it delays that. So, um, so we saw that there are some of those barriers. Secondly, the two other, th ten other things. One, people are eating more Westernized diets. You know, uh, you know, so burgers and burgers and burgers and you know, KFCs are all over the place now. So, you know, it's it kind represent of represent world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, but the thing is. Uh, you know, like in the United States, you have those KFCs, but you also have a good healthcare system that if you have cancer, you can go there, you can treat, right? If we are having that, but we're not, it's not corresponding to the investment into the treatment centers, then that's a bit bad, right? Environmental factors, so things like most African countries do pesticides, I mean, they, they do agriculture. So now they're going to deal with pesticides and things like that, which have increases, increased the environmental 
risk factors for cancer. Uh, so if you use fertilizers and things like that, it, it, you, know, you get exposed to toxins, you know, which can, can help go down the line. Um, the other thing is that people are living longer. We can change that now. Okay. So we used, used to think, uh, because cancer is always kind of comes when people are a little older. Um, and it used to be that people would die of other things like malaria, so, you know, uh, HIV AIDS and things like that very young. Now, because of the investments, partly because of the U.S. government and other, like Pepfar, that was a great initiative that saved a lot of lives for HIV AIDS. Um, so you see people living longer. But now they're getting cancers, you know, even in strong, higher rates than we thought. I mean, President Bush, who started Pepfar, um, uh, you know, he actually says this really well. I always say, you know, the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon Foundation, he says, how do you treat a woman cured of HIV is only for them to die of cancer. Because take cervical cancer, for example, it's a risk factor. A risk factor for that is HIV is the virus. Um, so, so if you cure the woman from the HIV AIDS, but you don't have infrastructure to address what's coming next because they're living longer, then they die too. So sometimes from his policy, that is not worth the investment. You know, why would you invest for somebody to survive from one disease only to die of another disease. It's better to really approach that comprehensively so that, you know, they can survive because that's what you want. Um, so that's one of the things. So we, we saw that because people are living longer, you know, they, they, they now have, um, you know, we're living young, longer, so we're having more cancer. So the policy makers really have to turn around and focus on that. And so as somebody, as a professor here in the United States, uh, one would ask, what are you doing for as locally here in the United States, and how does it tie into your work in global health? Yeah, I actually say, you know, what is from my lab at Harvard or you know, other institutions, you know, I, used, I always say that um, my work is about increasing access to care, actually. You know, people say, how do you do these different things together? And I said, well, they're only under the one umbrella. The one umbrella is you want to increase access to care, you know, so it doesn't matter who is doing what, you know, as long as you can make more people have access to quality cancer care. Uh, or, just healthcare in general, that's a really good thing. And so for my part, you know, I mean, I've done a number of things. Um, actually, one of the industry people who is on the panel now just talked about it. So we, the clinical trials, we, the inventions that we developed, I've talked to you about that in the past. Uh, so he, so we got that, the license, the technology from Harvard, from Harvard, Harvard State of Harvard, and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and now they are extending that to Africa. So we just came back from Ghana, with, we was there, we met with the first lady and the minister, and so um, the ambassador from Tanzania just invited us to come there as well. And um, so he, he's actually looking at how they can invest you know, money you know, to build hospitals, to bring that invention you know, that was developed at Harvard to bring that to, uh, to Africa. Yeah. So on my part, that's the kind of thing that I can do. They have this catalyzing work. Yeah, just for the benefit of those who haven't watched those previous uh, episodes, I know that it's a little bit of a repetition, <laughs> yeah. but very briefly, what is that technology for the person who is watching you for the first time? Yeah, so the technology is uh, called Tiny Drones to Target Cancer. So basically, if you think about Amazon, who's developing drones, I you know they're testing that out. You know, they can develop, uh, de deliver a package at your door, right? You give them the zip code, they come to your door, drop it off there. Um, you know, just fly there and do that. So what if you could use the same, right, but load cancer drugs into that to deliver them not outside the body, but precisely to the cancer? Because people who are conventional current treatments, you know, like chemotherapy, the reason why people lose their hair and all those things is because the, the cancer, when they take the treatment infusion, IV, it goes all over your body. Um, only about less than 5%, which is the cancer. Uh, and so, you know, so you're suffering from the other things. So the cancer, the, the drug is also, you know, like they lose your hair because, you know, the, the drugs usually target highly dividing cells. So, the, you know, so you have that indiscriminate action. And so what if you could focus that action only to the cancer, right? So that's, that's what the technology does. So we can deliver these, these drugs and we can amplify the damage to the cancer cells while spreading healthy tissue. Uh, so since 2015, that was done. We developed that uh, invention in my lab at Harvard, the Springham and Women's Hospital. And then, um, um, you know, so I think you asked a question earlier on today to some people about the patents. So actually, Dana Faber, uh, they have the patents for those technology. But it was really important that 
you know, we extend that to Africa. So the company just talking about that in the other uh, conference center, uh, that my condition was that if they're going to license that technology from Harvard, uh, they never bring them there. They, 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 they do. Then he must, he must extend that to Africa. You know, he actually talked about that in the other room, like, why not go to Merck or to these big companies? And I mean, I'm not saying we can do that, but one of the things that we really wanted to do was to make sure that, uh, like you said, you know, uh, asking the previous question, to make sure that people in other countries have access to it. And usually what's happened is that, you know, and that's, you know, in the United States, so people develop technology, it may be working, they could decide to share with, you know, and sell their most expensive technologies. And so this particular drone technology is actually very cost effective. Um, it doesn't, you know, $300 to $1,000, you can be able to give people treatment, right? Um, uh, if you project that, obviously companies can add their interest, you know, all those things. But it's going to be more effective than immunotherapy. Currently, immunotherapy in the United States is like what, three hundred thousand dollars. Even here in the United States, you will not have access to it. Uh, Africa doesn't even think about immunotherapy. So this technology can deliver the immunotherapy very precisely. So you need one one thousand or one ten thousand of the amount that you give to the patient. And by doing that, um, it means that the cost is less. And also, you know, it makes people have more access to it. So the treatment time is actually short. You don't have to keep having repeated infusions. The drone kind of zooms into the, the zip code, it zooms to the cancer, and then over time it delivers a drug over four weeks. Um, and so, you know, that really, you know, prevents the inconvenience of the patient from coming repeatedly, reduces the amount they have to deliver. Um, and so, so that's the invention, the tiny dose of the cancer. Uh, it won the Bright Features Prize in 2015 at Harvard. Uh, they kind of did different levels of it, which was um, um, first, you know, they had a scientist who reviewed, you know, other proposals, selected that, and then had to do like a shot can, had to present that in front of, you know, the deans and all those people. And then they put, they selected three, and they kind of three projects, and they put that out to the worldwide for people to vote on that. Uh, we had 95 countries vote for it, and all 50 states of the United States. And a lot of the votes came from Africa. <laughs> uh, so then the people from Africa were like saying, okay, when you get this technology, this invention, is it going to be something that's going to end up in the United States? What's the benefit in it for us for voting for it? Yes. And so at the end of the day, you know, the commitment was that if this ever gets, you know, uh, to see benefit, you know, anything, we have to make sure that Africa benefits from that too. And so that was my condition to the company that licensed the technology. And, and now they just talked about, you know, that now they are going to go to some of the ambassadors are inviting. So go to these different countries to start. Yeah. Uh, two questions about, first of all, incredible work. <laughs> we appreciate you, Dr. Hua. I mean, when we talk about the diaspora that are contributing significantly, not only to the United States, but the world, I think of you because mm -hmm. that's incredible. You know, when you're talking about bridging disparities, and uh, through research and innovation, that is an example that I very quickly give. Thank you. Uh, and you know, one of the things you mentioned is you were afraid of the possible cost increase. So what measures are in place, for example, that when this technology goes to <laughs> out of your space and your control, that it will actually be affordable? And uh, it, when it comes to the United States as well, uh, is there some mechanism in place to cap the price? When yeah. Out. And, and the clinical trials, what is the status? Yeah, so the status is that uh, right now we, for one of the clinical trials we're starting, we're one month away from starting that. Uh, for the one for immunotherapy, you know, we just announced that at the conference, um, you know, so at the end of this year, we're going to start that. But we already started clinical trials. So we started clinical trials in Tanzania, Nigeria, and South Africa. And this was like, laying the groundwork because um, we want to make sure that these countries have the infrastructure, you know, so that if you bring this technology, they can implement it. Because sometimes, you know, uh, you know, if you, if you buy, you know, if you buy a, block, a large, large truck and you go somewhere and the road is not, you know, it's not paved. I mean, it's, it's narrow. It's a bicycle road. You can drive it through it. So one thing we've done is that we started building the capacity. Uh, so we basically went to Tanzania and we actually seen that you know, it's good we're doing it. So there's some challenges that these countries are facing in implementing the technology. For example, you know, if you want to uh, administer the, the technology, we actually, uh, one of the ones who posted cancer is kind of actually easy. You just inject 
uh, it's a rice grain size, so you inject that into the prostate tumor, into the cancer, just like you do a biopsy right now, just do that. But, and then it releases the drones and they can go and, and, and target the cancer. So, but do these cancer centers in Africa, do they have the capacity, you know, to deliver that, to do that injection? Pretty simple, but do they have the capacity to do that injection? And we're seeing that, you know, uh, they need training. So, which really means that, you know, we're actually launching a course tomorrow at the summit that's geared towards training them. We have 1,800 people sign up for it now, which is really um, because they're eager to learn about this. But that's already preparing us now so that, you know, um, this clinical trial, because the clinical trial that's going on, I can tell you, it's, it's called hypofractionated radiation therapy. It's really, uh, instead of a patient, like a patient with prostate cancer, coming in 40 times, they only have to come in 20 times. And we've seen that in white populations in Europe, that if you do the 20 times, you get the same outcomes, like 40 times. But in Africa, that trial was not done with Africans, with black people. So Healthcare question, disparities, yeah, the blood spots. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you documented a really nice article about that at Harvard. So, that was really, mm -hmm. so that's the same thing. So now we're just saying, OK, you did it in European populations. You got this outcome. Let's try that with African populations and see. You know? um, and so that's the data that's coming. We're collecting that data right now. But it's good. It's an important step to the tiny drone technology because uh, that's the infrastructure that you use to do this clinical trial we're doing now is the same infrastructure that we need to deliver the drones. And so, you know, so now we are doing some quality control process, making sure that these centers have that infrastructure. And hopefully it will fit into the commission's work? Well, yeah, we actually in the commission talked about that. Um, and IEA, the speaker in the IEA just commented that, com commented about that because um, it's one of the commission report uh, really strongly asks that, you know, countries adopt this approach more. Uh, which was also recommended in the United States during COVID-19. And so adopt that more so that uh, it can increase access to care. So think about the case I just said. You have a prostate cancer or breast cancer. So let's say prostate cancer. You come in 40 times. That's how many times the patient has to come and see the doctor. And then instead of doing that, the patient comes in only 20 times. What does that mean? It means that for one, uh, it means that two people can come instead of one. You know, that's a 100% increase in access. Plus, patients don't, they don't want to come 40 times. So patient inconvenience, right? So that's a really a big benefit that the patient doesn't have to come 40 times. Usually they have to travel long distances from remote areas. And we're actually doing the cost analysis now. One of my medical students just went uh, to Tanzania to do that kind of analysis. Um, and we're seeing that that's a huge thing, right? So, uh, so having that. But with a drug technology, we don't need 40 times. We don't need 20 times. We need one time. <laughs> so it means, in principle, if, you can, if it works, then the time it takes for you to treat one person, you can treat 40 people. That's huge. And I'm wondering, uh, have you, are you also going to do any clinical trials here in the United States? Yes. So we just got the funding from the United States and National Institute to do that, starting from Dana Farber at Harvard Medical School and Johns Hopkins, the two sites. And then now, so we're at the end of this conference, we, so these three sites were already started. Uh, Saturday, we're going to have a discussion with them. Oh my God, I'm so time. excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question because, I mean, part of it is the resources, right? So, and, you know, the vetted, I mean, obviously, it's also good to have that validation yeah. uh, that people see the promise in that. Back to the cost control. Mm -hmm. The question. Remember, it was a two-part question. Yeah. The co how do you yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, that's a difficult one. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so we don't have to get into Yeah, no, but I want to answer it okay. because I think it's really important. So, um, so one of the things that, so generally, if it becomes really successful, the question is how can you enforce that they don't jack up your prices, right? Which is something that people, have, we've seen that happen with most people. When you start making profit and your investors, the investors, investors are saying, oh, let's make more profit. You know, the board directs what happens, right? So they can jack up the price. What will I do in that case? Um, so, you know, so I really make sure that actually in, the, number one, in signing the license patent with this company, that there was language in there that said that if you're going to a low resource settings, you, you have to cap what you can charge. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so we said that, yeah. Um, so that, that helps, you know, I mean, 
Um, and then the second thing is that, you know, I mean, part of it is just, we're actually working with, so the guy is actually, uh, Eric Broers is his name. He's actually been a very successful investor in the United States. And he's African-American. He has a lot of interest in Africa. Um, and so he's really committed to doing something there. Um, and so part of it was also just seeing that, you know, we had somebody um, who is aligned with our interests, you know. Um, and, I, and I tell him, you know, it's weird, you know, that you know, people, but I also know, and I've told him too, that once you start making money, right, the pressure from your advice, your, your, your board, you know, it couldn't matter whether he decides, right, they could fire him, right, if he's not having all the control. And it will get somebody there who's going to make them more money, right? So, <laughs> so what were you doing that case? So that's why I really try to put in that language, language there. Uh, there are other ways we can go around it. I, you know, and I think, um, you know, as the inventor, you know, and this is not so usually companies would like to, um, you know, make sure the inventor is on the company, but I deliberately decided not to do that. Um, and it's really you can make money from that. You know, why would I not do it? And I've had people say, why are you not doing that? Uh, but I think it's good to stay back because you can always innovate around. There, there are ways you can innovate around. Uh, once you get on the board, and the bo once you get on the board of the companies, they can then direct what you have to do. And, and, and if they decide to jack up the prices, they have you in control in some ways. I decide to stay out, uh, support the work, you know. I mean, we have this, this, this is what we're doing. The funding that we got from NIH is really something that is a collaborative grant. You know, where I'm part of the, I'm one of the principal collaborators, uh, the principal investigator team. Um, you know, that includes other people from Dana Faber, some people from Johns Hopkins, uh, and the company itself. Um, so that kind of collaborative work I'm willing to do, but without being beholden, so to say, to the companies. And some of the investors are actually asking, you know, I can't, I don't want to invest in a company where the inventor is not on the on the board. Uh, but you know, I I also think. You know, the, I don't want to do that also at this point. I don't think it's the right thing until we get it to the ground and it's, it's working uh, the way we want it and the prices are not jacked up. Um, you know, I, I made that commitment, like right. I mentioned, and I want to stick to it. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's <laughs> integrity. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I know we could go on. There's other research you're doing. I'm not even going to get into it today with the, about uh, the, him, the plant. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I wish you said another time to follow that up. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to talk about it at this summit? On on Saturday, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, okay, since I've introduced it here very quickly, uh, how does it tie into the work you're doing with the commission and also yeah, for the commission, with the global health? Yeah, so the commission for, for cancer in particular, so most cancer patients are anemic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're taking all these chemotherapy drugs and, um, you know, most cancer patients who are taking their treatment destroying their immune system, you know, so they're anemic. So the blood plant, you know, is, we see a connection here because um, these are things that, you know, products that are being developed, they're being grown and developed in Africa themselves. So, you know, if you're a cancer patient, you know, you can have access to that for sure. Uh, that's a very limited, I mean, the anemia, anemia on is not the biggest goal of the blood plant, but that's an example. To show that you know you can actually use it connected to this, this report. I know it has uh, different applications. Yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. The blood transfusion and stuff like that, developing a blood substitute, is also very interesting, important because for the Lancet Commission, we think that you know for people who have combined treatments, um, you know, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy, you know, sometimes you actually ablate, you, you you destroy. You want to do a bone marrow transplant plan for a kid for somebody. You have to destroy their immune system, um, and so they have to reconstitute that in some way. So with the blood plan, we think that you have to do blood transfusion, and sometimes um, if the blood groups are not compatible, you know, you have to keep looking for somebody who eventually going to do that. And that's the unique thing about the blood plan is that um, when we develop the blood substitute from that, it's not, you know, it's agnostic to the blood group, so it doesn't depend on the blood group of the person. And so any patient can basically have it. So we see applications coming in there as well. Um, and so Saturday we're going to talk about that. Uh, the NFL player, uh, players, uh, of one of their representatives, Calvin Johnson, who you should talk to, I think. Yes. Uh, he's, uh, he's going to be um, honored this evening. So it's one of the um, awardees. Um, so um, 
when can I? Well, we'll talk about that later. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so I think so. He's very, he's very committed. You know, not just to equity issues here in the United States, but also looking at leveraging his platform to support this kind of work. So, uh, the blood plant, you know, they're interested in doing that. So, I think there's an opportunity to partner with them. Absolutely. And uh, again, bring <laughs> us back to today's summit. Yeah. What is one of your biggest uh, the outputs you're looking out for uh, by the end of this summit? Collaborations. Uh, so one is already emerging. The idea you may have heard about that. The idea that um, we can engage with the Cantamon shop in the United States. And African Union. They had to leave. Um, uh, ambassador had to leave earlier. Um, seems very committed as well. You know. So what we want to get out of the summit coming out of this is really to have some concrete actions where we can have more collaborations in the U.S. government level or institutions with African government, maybe the African Union in this case. So we're going to be following up on that. Uh, so this is a really important conversation to start from there. We're also going to be coming out with collaborations about capacity building. Tomorrow's session is going to highlight that, working with the IAEA, the UN government, the UN organization. Uh, For the interest of our viewers who don't know what IAEA is. Yeah, so the IAEA is the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, it's one of the UN, uh, it's part of the branch of the United Nations. Uh, they're based in Austria mainly, but they're the ones who are really interested. They're doing a lot of the government engagement in Africa and making sure that people have access to cancer treatment, technology therapy. Um, so, uh, so they are here, uh, you know, because of some of these uh, innovation collaborations that we want to do uh, with them. And so uh, tomorrow will be capacity building, and then there will be an outreach session during the day, you know, getting community outreach. And then the following day, we'll talk about uh, the plant, plant medicines and research. So yes. phytomedicines, to do more collaborations around that. So, Excellent. So what is the one thing you want to give our, say to our viewers for, before we wrap this session up? Yeah, uh, one thing I would like to say, and that's a really important question, is you know, all of us can contribute. This commission report basically comes up with, you know, describes a crisis that's happening in Africa. Um, here in the United States, one out of three people have a risk of developing cancer. So, you know, it's something that's shared. And one of the things I want to take away is that if we collaborate, because it's a shared cost, um, if we collaborate, we have a better chance of success and meeting the cancer moonshot's goal of having cancer deaths in the United States, doing the same thing in Africa, uh, that would be a huge thing. But everybody can contribute. You know, it could be somebody who don't think you know you have to be a cancer scientist like me or a professor or you know somebody who does you know different things. Even you, by educating the public you're already contributing to the fight. That's so important. You know, you don't know what that means. It's really, well, you know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but, but that's important. Yeah. Uh, people, we, you're going to see, you have kids here who have de developed videos to just educate patients, um, you know, about healthcare, you know, things like that. People, if you're in technology, you can invest in telehealth that we just talked about. You know, if you are in, uh, you're a church person, you know, a, a religious leader, you can move away from just stopping patients from going to see conventional treatment, you know, you're not God. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, religious treatment is not good. I mean, sometimes, you know, you, 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 can, you need to do both, right? So you can pray for somebody, but you can also go to the hospital, not say don't go to the hospital. And so engaging these people and also educating them, they also have a role to play. The traditional leaders, that's what this commission showed, was that we have to engage them because sometimes you have a lot of people who are trapped there. You know, they're just seeing the traditional leader, but they're not seeing all the evidence-based treatments. And so engaging them as part of the healthcare system, because in phytomedicine, we see that 80% of African populations use that uh, phytomedicine in some ways. And so if you can engage that healthcare system, um, you know, you can do more. So I think everybody has a role. That's one of the things I just want to say, you know. And if, if, you, if you are wondering what you can do to contribute to address the cancer incidence in Africa or deaths in Africa, you can definitely talk to me. I can tell you what you can do, you know. So that's the takeaway, you know. When I'm, um, what message, uh, what can you tell uh, the, our communities here in the United States that have been, in, and families that have been impacted by cancer? And how can we, you know, how does your work contribute to this? Yeah, for families that have been impacted by cancer, uh, I, I really think you have an important voice in, you know, in supporting some of the things that are around cancer. You know, cancer moonshot, you know, it kind of sounds really big, but part of it just begins with local advocacy, you know, telling your story, you know encouraging policymakers to put their investment. They've done that a lot in being able to get something like the first cancer moonshot done by President Obama. So just 
you know, as a role for families, families should keep advocating for that, you know. Um, as to, you know, the, the research that we've done, the innovation, you know, I just, what I would like to say is that, you know, I mean, I think for, for, for families like that, you know, we feel the same. I mean, I have family very close that has cancer and they're dealing with cancer and they're actually counting, you know, they keep saying they're counting the days to start treatment, you know, with the, with the technology that I developed. You know, so I, I, I can understand that, and I think that that's part of the reason why, you know, it drives me each day. It gives me purpose. Each morning I will get up in the morning, I think, you know, what can I do, you know, so that we can advance, uh, increase access to treatment so that people can be cured, not to die, you know, if you have cancer. So for families like that, you know, I think I want to do more, you know, uh, it motivates me to do more so that, you know, they don't have to keep dealing with, when they have cancer, it doesn't mean you're going to die. Yeah. Hope, there's hope there. So. Again, Dr. Tangwa, thank you for all the work you do uh, <laughs> for us here in the United States and also for the global health. Because I know the global health has satellites in Europe, in Africa. So it's not just something contained to the Johns Hopkins building today. Yeah. So thank you, thank you so much. And uh, will there be other satellites uh, events? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. We're gonna, I want to share some more with you. We have one coming up in Nigeria, we have one coming up in Sweden. Uh, we have one coming up in Tanzania. The minister just invited, ambassador just invited us to that. So yeah, I'll share some more with you, and I hope we can continue the conversation. Absolutely, <laughs> the, the, the conversation over. started in 2018, know, and they are I going know. to go as long as we both can do. Yeah. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for your time, and thank thanks you. for yes. the work. Yeah, thank you. And thank to you. all our viewers, I hope you've uh, learned a lot from my conversation with uh, Dr. Wilfred Ngua. He is the brainchild behind <laughs> the Global Health Catalyst Summit. And when I say that, it's very, it's wide, it's impacted, uh, you know, not just the United States, but Africa and Europe and uh, Asia. So we are thankful for you and looking forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Till next time.